Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Charlie Coker, Executive Director of Asia Society of Southern California. Welcome to our program, MedTech, Preparing for the Next Pandemic, Lessons Learned and Looking Ahead. We're delighted to be hosting this program in partnership with Bioscience LA. The discussion today will seek to examine these most critical and important questions of how we can continue to drive innovation in healthcare, increase health equality, improve global collaboration, and address vaccine effectiveness against variants and its global The moderator for today's program is Yuan Li. Yuan is Director for Strategy and Business Development at the global medtech company Massimo, and a member of our own very own Asia Society of Southern California Advisory Board. So without further ado, I'll turn it Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm excited that we have audience dialing in today, not only from US, but also from China, Hong Kong, India, Singapore, Philippines, Poland, Switzerland, and UK. The event is also being live streamed on our Facebook page. So a big thank you to our audience across the time zones. Our world has been dealing with the pandemic in the past one and a half year. With the global vaccine rollout and COVID case dropping in the US, I know we're all asking ourselves the question, are we there yet? Is the pandemic over yet? Can we finally return to normal? What lessons have we learned and are we ready to deal with possible new breakouts, new variant, or even another pandemic? There are no simple answers to these questions, but fortunately today, we have three great speakers from the healthcare industry to help us navigate. We will discuss how to continue to drive innovation, increase health equality, and improve global collaboration to be better prepared for the future. We want to make this session interactive, so please send in your question in the Q&A box. We will also push out a poll with two questions for everyone to participate, and we'll publish the answer later in the program. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce our panelists, Dr. Sachin Jane. Susan Tusi and Dr. William Hesselting. Dr. Sachin Jane is president and CEO of Scan Health, Scan Group and Health Plan. Most recently, Sachin was president and CEO of Care More Health. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and was an editor of the book, The Soul of Doctor. Sachin is an adjunct professor of medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine and a contrib uh, contributor at Forbes. He also served on the board of director at Make-A-Wish America. Sachin graduated from Harvard College uh, in government and earned his MD from Harvard Medical School and MBA from Harvard Business School. He trained in medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Susan Tosi is chief Ma commercial officer at Illumina where she leads global sales, commercial operation, and commercial strategy. Susan was previously chief product officer at Illumina. She has more than 25 years of research and development and business leadership at Fortune 100 technology companies and within the life science industry. Susan was named one of the 50 top diverse leaders for 2020 by the California Diversity Council and is a member of the International Women's Forum. Susan holds an MBA degree from UCLA and an honor BS in engineering science and mechanic from Pennsylvania State University. Lastly, Dr. William Hazelting is currently chair and president of Access Health International, a foundation active in the US and in Asia. He was a professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health from 1976 to 1993, where he was founder and chair of the division of biochemical pharmacology and the Division of Human Retrovirology. He's well known for his pioneering work on cancer, HIV, and genomics. Eight pharmaceutical products from companies he founded are currently approved by US and international regulatory agencies. He has authored more than 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals and more than a dozen books, including A Family Guide to COVID and, Vari and Variants, The Shape-Shifting Challenge of COVID-19. So let's start a panel. I want to start the panel with a positive note. Susan, um, I know Illumina has always been a leader in innovation. COVID has accelerated the innovation in healthcare. What are the most important trends of innovation you have seen during the past year? And do you think they're here to stay post pandemic? Well, thank you for the question. And um, it is, you know, amidst the uh, 
pain and suffering of COVID, we have seen uh, science and innovation play a really dramatic role. And here we are, as you say, like one and a half years later, it's not three years later, that we have uh, very effective vaccines, you know, more than 50% of the, you know, available population um, vaccinated. And we're starting in the US, like largely to get on with life. And that was driven by the fact that, you know, innovation has really helped us from the first time the viral sequence was published in January. Um, it really started the clock on development of vaccines, the development of vaccines, which uh, has been, I think, the great scientific story um, of COVID and uh, really these RNA based vaccines that I think are going to have a lot of repercussions on, um, you know, vac vaccines for many other uh, diseases long term. Um, you know, were started by the fact that we understood the genetics of the virus. And um, we at Illumina um, are really proud of the fact that our technology has really enabled uh, much of this to happen. Um, in fact, uh, the variants of the virus, um, and we know that this virus is fastly evolving, we have to kind of stay ahead of it with uh, getting, getting uh, the population vaccinated. But the variants of the virus that have been submitted to um, public databases like GISAID. Um, the last I saw, 78% of them um, have come off of our sequencing platforms. Um, so our sequencing uh, technology, its availability, its cost, um, and the seamless uh, you know, nature of being able to do the kind of bioinformatics analysis, submit to these public databases has really allowed us to collect a vast store of uh, information that can be shared publicly um, on the virus and uh, its you know, subsequent mutations. So I think these are things that are uh, lasting um, in terms of you know, the uh, innovations that will uh, not only empower us uh, for this pandemic and have allowed us you know, within a year and a half to have highly effective vaccines available you know, at scale, um, but also um, I think hopefully will allow us to get ahead of mutations of this virus, allow us to uh, get uh, ahead of new pathogens that may have emerged as possible um, kind of global pandemics. I hope we can keep things from becoming pandemics in the future. So I am indeed an optimist. Um, I think our technology uh, is, you know, continuing to drive very hard. Our, I know our employee base is um, completely inspired by the fact that we've played such a critical role uh, in, uh, in, you know, the COVID pandemic and, um, and we're inspired to do more. Uh, so I do think that, uh, that all of these things are um, everlasting and have, um, have you know, uh, taught us that uh, technology is the path and data sharing is the path uh, for us to, you know, keep from having uh, such pathogens become uh, global pandemics and, you know, threaten the lives of, uh, um, of uh, the number of people that have been in impacted by the pandemic. Um, one of the uh, things that, you know, I think, I, I hope that the rest of the panel will uh, engage in talking about is how we inspire more collaboration, collaboration of data, collaboration as we see mutations, um, surveillance, uh, really, you know, this concept uh, that our CEO has put out there, which is a bioforce, which is uh, staying ahead of new pathogens that arise and then globally sharing that information so that we can kind of like a, you know, weather tracking system um, be uh, alerted to things before they become kind of out of hand. And so I, um, I look forward to engaging on that discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. And I think uh, congratulations to you and Illumina that Illumina do donated 60 million to a global passenger uh, collaboration initiative. So, so great job on that. Um, Sachin, on a less positive note, um, except, uh, except propelling for innovation, the pandemic has also revealed the difference in access to healthcare among different groups, be it ethnical, regional, or income groups. So health equality now is front and center, and I know that's a topic that's dear to your heart too. So please comment on this health equality. How do we achieve health equality going forward? Uh, thanks, Yuan. I, I, first of all, I think actually there's a, a lot of optimism that comes from this question as well, um, na namely that I think um, COVID really laid bare some of the 
inequalities that exist in our society that previously were the subject of academic inquiry and academic papers. I think there's now broad recognition that what zip code you were born in or live in uh, ultimately affects your health outcomes you know, more than we'd previously like to admit that it did. And so I think we have an opportunity as a society to now more, I think, carefully think about strategies to improve health across communities. I think organizations have um, begun to pivot from talking about health inequalities to actually developing you know, proactive strategies to actually address those uh, underlying inequalities. And I think a lot of our kind of national um, health advocacy agenda or health policy agenda has shifted away from talking about, you know, you know kind of standard fare topics like health insurance and healthcare access um, to actually looking at healthcare outcomes and looking at healthcare outcomes by group. And, um, you know, I think what you've seen is in the, in particular in the Biden administration is the appointment of a number of individuals, the creation of new positions that are really focused on addressing uh, health equity. And uh, if you look at the identities of the people who are in charge of you know, our federal healthcare infrastructure, many of them carry with them a deep passion for improving health equity. Uh, so I, you know, I'm more optimistic uh, than I've been in a long time that these issues are going to be front and center, that they're gonna be the subject of additional scientific research, health services research, and but more importantly, they're gonna be the subject of, I think the strategy development for our country at a policy level, but also at the corporate level. Um, I lead an organization uh, that's focused on serving older adults, scan group and health plan. And you know, what I would say is, um, you know, we're taking a hard look at our internal data and identifying inequities where they exist. And now taking the steps that we need to take to reach out to populations who, whose outcomes aren't as good as we'd like them to be. We look at medication adherence, which is one of the core measures we track as an organization. And we realize that there are pretty significant inequities between Caucasians, African-Americans, and Latinos. And so what we're in the process of doing is really, I think, building a strategy to actually close that gap, uh, close that disparity, and ultimately try to move outcomes. Where I think this field had been stuck for years, frankly, and I, you know, it has was we like to talk about things, but we didn't actually like to solve things. And so you know, we had documented healthcare disparities but in terms of actually building solutions to address those healthcare disparities, we were far behind the times. And so I'm, I'm optimistic. I think that there's more of a, a forward, uh, there, there's more of fo more forward motion in closing healthcare disparities today than there was at any time in the future. In the, in the, I'm sorry, than any time in the past. But ultimately, I think you know um, the proof is going to be in the pudding on whether we actually accomplish those changes. I, I would say the other piece of it that's important to acknowledge is that um, you know. We, we have to do far more than just improve healthcare in these communities. Um, we have to look at health, uh, look at income inequality more broadly in the country. We have to look at um, you know, uh, inequality of access to services, inequality of access to other social services that ultimately drive, I think, some of the outcomes as well. So um, again, I think that this is a journey of many decades ahead of us, but the fact that we've actually, at least for the first time in, in a long time, actually aligned on this being a problem uh, to me, is a is a source of optimism. Thank you, Sachin, and thank you for turning my slightly negative note to a very positive note. I actually, have a follow up question on that. Uh, Susan mentioned that you know technology is the way in the future. Do you think technology actually foster or or hinder health equality? The reason I ask that is, for example, senior population sometimes they're not so good with technology. So curious about your opinion on that. So I think technology, you know, like every tool, um, you, it can be used for good or it can be not used for good. And, and I think the question is, is what is your intent? Um, what is your intent as an organization? What is your intent, uh, you know, uh, your strategic intent around applying technology? We were able to use telehealth to deliver healthcare to a number of seniors who previously we used to say would never use it. Um, you know, the, the entire U.S. healthcare outpatient infrastructure almost moved exclusively to telehealth over, over the course of weeks, right. a change that we thought was gonna take years. And we, we had frankly underestimated the ability of some populations, aging adults included, uh, you know, to actually use technology to address healthcare issues. And so, um, uh, you know, again, I think it's just about your intent, you know, and, and how you distribute technology um, that ultimately influences how it gets used. I, you know, I, and I, I just wanna make a quick point about, um, yeah, I want to build on Susan's point around uh, around technology being, you know, kind of the enabler. 
at the end of the day, I think we tend to think about, you know, unequal access to drugs, unequal access to vaccines as being a driver of inequality. Um, but at the end of the day, there are certain healthcare problems that are only going to be solved through technology and innovation. I learned that when I, uh, during a brief tour of duty, um, working at, at Merck. And, you know, you just saw yesterday the first, you know, the approval of, of the first medicine focused on Alzheimer's, you know, in, in almost a decade. Um, and the reality is, is that, you know, that medicine may or may not be great. We'll find out over time. There's a lot of controversy about that. But again, um, there are some problems that are only going to be solved through innovation. And sometimes innovation is applied une uh, unequally. Um, I think we have to do a better job applying that innovation more equally and making it more broadly available. But at the end of the day, I think um, it's important to recognize the specific role that scientific and technical innovation has in solving big problems. And then it's, you know, it's up to policymakers, payers, you know, to make sure that we're evenly distributing that innovation. But at the end of the day, you need that innovation in the first place, which is, an, you know, is missing from a lot of uh, health policy conversations, I think. And I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Sachin. Bill, um, thank you for joining us. I know that you and Access Health has done extensive work in Asia, especially in India. And the pandemic is by its nature a global issue. Uh, Sachin talked about inequality within the US and we wanna look at globally and look at vaccine rollout and inequality of that. So can you comment on uh, the situation in India right now and a new wave of lockdown in Asia, how that might impact US and the rest of the world? And how, do, how can we stay vigilant uh, against uh, new variants? Thank you for those uh, questions. <clears throat> what I'd like to uh, do is maybe start with a broader perspective. Uh, for the last uh, 15, 17 years, I've been the founder and chair of Access Health International. And our goal is to work to help everybody in the world have access to high quality, affordable care. Now, we're very far from that today, as you know. And as the previous uh, speakers, uh, Susan and Sachin pointed out, uh, there are great inequalities within countries and between countries. Access Health looks at those inequalities in both in, within countries and uh, between countries. And particularly, we focus on trying to understand what best practices are and how you can bring those best practices in one country to other countries. There's been an evolution in my career from trying to solve problems through fundamental science then applying that to drug and uh, vaccine development, uh, and then moving on to helping governments understand what they must do. I think one thing that's clear is there are enormous inequalities that are built in to countries, entire countries. You mentioned India. India is one such country, and we do a lot of work there. China, for all of its progress, is still one of those countries where there's great inequalities in health. And then there's entire continents, Africa and South America, where for the most part, there are serious inequalities in access to health and I could go on. One thing you see is that if you don't have a high quality health system and you're faced with any health issue, pandemic in particular highlights it, you're in trouble. Look at India today. India has gone through two massive waves now. Whether you count 300,000 people dead or 3 million people dead, depends how you count. The actual answer is we don't know and they don't know. All we know is that Ganges was filled with floating bodies and many, many people have died. And that is a consequence of failing to take the virus really seriously and a health system which is not functioning particularly well. You know, one thing, if you want to take a lesson that we learned from this pandemic is it doesn't take a drug and it doesn't take a vaccine, and it might not even take a lot of technology to solve the COVID problem because countries have done it. A number of countries have reduced the level of infection and death so that over the last year, you can count on your hands and your toes the number of people in those countries that have died of COVID. So you're counting in single digits 
not in the hundreds of thousands, which is true of many countries, my own country included. And what does that tell you? It tells you that given the right political, social climate, this disease is controllable. It's just most countries don't have that. And then you ask yourself, why don't they have that? That is a question for historians, for sociologists, for philosophers, for psychoanalysts. It's an unanswered question, but it's a very, very deep question. You know, in the West, we tout our science and our technology, and we should be proud of that. But boy, would we be sunk if we didn't have it. Depending on that, when we know you can solve the problem without it, is pretty risky. And we've paid the price in hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens who are dead because we didn't learn the lessons that we taught other countries. If you look at any public health book, it'll tell you how to solve a pandemic problem. Diagnose, contact trace, and isolate. We did all three of those poorly, as did almost the rest of the world. Very few people did that well. Diagnose, contact trace, and isolate. Those countries that don't do that are in for continued trouble. This virus isn't going to stay put any more than flu virus stays put. Our vaccines may be better, but not that much better. Then we're not going to have to face this again and again. This virus is changing fast. I was just reviewing some very interesting studies about where and how this virus changes. And as you mentioned, I wrote a book on the topic, and I'm still going to school learning more about it. I suspected the virus could do some of the things we're now seeing it do, uh, which you'll be reading about in due course, but it is a formidable virus. But without that fundamental ability to confront it from socio-political perspectives, we are relying on what is ultimately a rather fragile tool that also, as we have learned in the United States, depends on socio-political acquiescence and implementation. The North of the United States is very different from the South in terms of how many people wanna be vaccinated, how many people wear masks, what kind of things we're going to do. And that is true around the world. It's not just in the United States, it, it's in many countries. The other thing we've learned is although there is a great emphasis on collaboration and I've talked and written about what a wonderful thing science has done in this has brought us as a community together in ways to it, frankly, I'm, as a scientist for many decades, surprised to see and very pleased to see. It's not a surprise when you look at history that in times of plague, there's scapegoating, serious scapegoating. Let me just remind you that all the Jews in Western Europe were exterminated during the plague of 1300s, exterminated. There was not a single Jew left in all Western Europe. The Pope said, don't blame them. They're not poisoning your wells. They're dying like you are. That didn't stop scapegoating. Scapegoating is not a solution to a plague. Cooperation, as the previous speakers mentioned, is a solution to the plague. Looking at, at it for what it is, not what you want it to be. Plague is not politically convenient for anybody. It's not economically convenient for anybody but it is what it is and it's your responsibility to do your best to learn from the rest of the world and to try to solve the problems. And that isn't what we have done. Are we going to learn from our failures? Some of us may learn, but many of us won't and haven't. And as we face the recurrence of this, which is likely, as we face new plagues, I worry that we haven't done enough to educate ourselves and our people about the need for social solidarity, about the need for efficient public health, about the need for equity for every citizen, not only in a country, in all countries, to access to high quality, affordable health. So I'll leave it there. There's a lot more I could say, but I think this, uh, we got an interesting panel and I hope some interesting questions to discuss. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bill. You definitely expanded my question greatly. Um, I want to build on what you talked about, right? You, you mentioned that no one country has done all things right, but I think some countries have done something better and some countries done another better. For example, 
uh, in Asia at the beginning of the pandemic, Asia is better at or more efficient at locking down mask wearing, social distancing. Whereas now in the US, production and distribution of vaccine is more effective. So we seem to turn the corner. My question to all of you, to Susan, to Phil and to Sachin is, how do we learn from each other? How, what is the best practice, as Bill, you mentioned in your comment? How does East and West learn from each other? Well, that's a tough one because uh, it takes, you know, progress in terms of mankind actually being open to others, doing things better than they do in socio-political environments, like learning from one another. Um, I, I do think, uh, you know, that as, uh, uh, as you know, Charlie mentioned that we are, um, we, we should have locked down way before we did. I mean, that's like clear. We should have locked down. We should have taken it seriously. We should have, um, you know, been testing, isolating all. We sh we could have um, prevented the, you know, the widespread uh, nature. Uh, at the same time, I think the, you know, the science and technology helped us in understanding that this was a, you know, um, novel virus, and the start of the clock of, you know, developing new vaccine for the virus and then scaling those, you know, the US is good at brute force and being able to really turn the supply chain and scaling of vaccines. So the countries uh, like, you know, a colleague of mine who's in New Zealand and I would very much like her to come to the US where we wanna um, have a meeting together. And, you know, New Zealand did really well. They locked down early, they took it seriously, but you know what, their vaccination rate, very low. So, you know, they're, they're kind of stuck in their country. They can't move out or they're, you know, quarantined when they get back. The reality is we are like all so globally connected that if we took the best of breed, which is that we would have isolated, we would have kept it from spreading, we would have benefited from development of vaccines, we would have benefited from really the global supply chain. And we're not, you know, none of us are really vaccinated until all of us are vaccinated. If you would have done all those things right, we would have had a uh, massive improvement in the number of lives lost and, uh, and you know, the effective, um, you know, protection of everyone with vaccines. So, you know, I, I think that you know, the more that we can be uh, open, uh, at least as a scientific community, that we, this is like, you know, not a uh, new thing that has happened. Like the world has suffered from plagues before, from viruses before, and, um, and how do we, um, you know, despite whatever the political climate is in any one country, that as a global scientific community, we come together and we make the best use of um, the reality of how viruses spread, but also the technology that can kind of keep us ahead. The other thing is uh, that, you know, has come up is access to everyone. Like every human being has the right to good health care and how do we create that access uh, for every you know, human being to have um, you know, the best uh, access to vaccines, that uh, they have the information necessary to know that they are safe. I mean, these have been the largest clinical trials, the safest vaccines that have ever been developed. And, um, and how do we make sure that that is like equally treated? Um, and the last point I will make is on data sharing. You know, if we can get beyond uh, the fear factor of sharing information across, you know, the finger pointing and whatever it might be, and you know, fixing blame rather than fixing a human, you know, human issue. Um, if we can uh, share data and make sure that everyone understands the variants that are going to cause um, problems in the future and get ahead of those, and uh, that in any one geography when they're found, that we're sharing that as quickly as possible globally. I think um, you know we'd be in much much better shape. We need to le learn from this experience and continue to progress. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, we actually uh, pushed two polls at the beginning and now we have the poll results. Let me just publish that. So the first question we have is, given the US in the process of reopening, are you concerned with lifting COVID restrictions? It's pretty evenly distributed. So we have 45% says yes, 24 says no, and 31% says depends on the vaccine rate. So the majority of people are concerned here about lifting the COVID restriction. 
The second question is, are you comfortably fly? Are you comfortable flying domestically? 41% says yes, 22% no, and 36% is depends on safety measure. So yeah, the reason we want to do the polls is just to get audience opinion and do a temperature, a temperature check on where we are in this pandemic. And uh, when we can see the pandemic over and when we can go back to our normal life. So related to this poll, I wanna ask a question. Um, while we see outbreak in Asia and there's variants traveling into the US, do you think the reopening now uh, in almost every state um, is a little bit too soon? Are we too soon to declare victory or are we pretty much um, on the way to, to open them back to normal? I'm happy to, I, you know, I, I think it's, you know, I, I think we can declare, there's a lot of victories we can declare. I mean, I, I think we have um, many successes that we've enjoyed. I think the fact that we um, were able to innovate as quickly as we, we did, the fact that we're able to reopen safely um, in, in many situations, you know, I think to build, you know, to, to Dr. Heseltine's point, I think we have, um, you know, th this is not the first time we're going to go through this. This is going to persist and we have to develop better muscle memory around how to deal with this and, and kind of a, at the core of that, frankly, is we need to reestablish trust between the U.S. scientific establishment and the, and the American population. I think if, you know, uh, if one of the really good outcomes is that we um, were able to lay bare some of the social, uh, you know, and, and uh, social and health inequalities that exist in this country, I think one of the other kind of good outcomes is we've been able to lay bare the fact that people don't trust science, they don't trust medicine. Um, and that's different than it was 20, you know, two to three generations ago, where I think trust in science and medicine were, were frankly higher, you know, than they probably should have been. But at the, at the same point, uh, at, you know, at the same time, I think um, we need to, you know, think collectively about how we can kind of rebuild that trust between the scientific and medical establishments and, and the U.S. population. I think that's going to be the task ahead for any one of us who works in this field. Thank you, Sachin. And we talk a little bit about supply chain. I think, Susan, you mentioned about supply chain. And we see a lot of pressure um, in supply chain uh, with regard to PPE and to vaccine. Um, and recently, China is lock, uh, locking down Guangzhou again. And that impacts supply chain worldwide as well. So um, question on that is, how do we increase the comparability and efficiency of our supply chain going force. Well, you know, very early on, I wrote a piece on what was going to happen to our supply chains. It was obvious that this had shut down our supply chains and we were going to have serious issues. And I think all businesses realized that. Actually, that's one of the very first things that business realized is that we've got a supply chain problem and just in time isn't going to work anymore. There are articles on what's happening in Japan now with their just in time. Uh, and that means you need to have diverse uh, supply chains. You need to have local supply chains and uh, shudder to think of it. You need inventory as well. Uh, and all that is uh, changing. But I think there's something that's uh, perhaps even more fundamental, which is that countries have come to realize that you have to have, if not in country capability, at least regional capabilities. Let's take vaccines. One of the things I've been working on now with the international banks and uh, finance organizations is trying to make sure that entire continents that now lack vaccine capability have it. Not just standard vaccine capabilities, but even the most advanced capabilities. And I think that that's one thing that the continent should get together. Now, there's a huge effort and it's generally been an effort for many decades. The rich should help the poor. But I'll tell you something else, the poor should help themselves as well. It is true that there is an obligation for the richer countries to help the poor countries, but that doesn't mean the poor countries can rely on that entirely. In fact, when they do that, it leads to corruption and nothing, a lot doesn't get done. You know, the same thing in the American healthcare system, those systems that do best, they're saying, Despite what happens in Washington, despite what happens in my capital, we're going to make ourselves as good as possible. I wrote a book about that. 
It's called uh, World Class, a study of an academic medical center. that was failing that said, we're not going to rely on the government to solve our problem if we don't solve it ourselves. And they did it brilliantly. That's a whole part of the discussion that we need. We need local capabilities for supply chain, for medical supplies, and for vaccines and even high-tech supplies. Yes, international organizations can help, but they can't do it. Let me give you a really good example of what a country that you might not think of did to help an entire population. And that's Egypt with hepatitis C, with diabetes, with hypertension. They had a loan from the World Bank, so it, international organizations helped. The president got behind it. And they created this thing called 100 Million Healthy Lives. And I was there three times looking at the program. A friend of mine helped structure it. The basic goal was to eliminate hepatitis C, which is a huge problem for them. About uh, They have the highest rate, had the highest rate in the world. In 10 months, everybody in the country was tested for hepatitis C, hypertension, and diabetes. There were 10,000 sites. They all had their little tablets. You had instant data. So you knew exactly who was tested, where they were tested, what the age distribution, the sex distribution, the income distribution. You had everything instantly available. Everybody had a finger stick to see if they are positive antibodies for hepatitis C. They had a PCR test. Now, you know how much PCR tests and uh, antigen tests cost in the United States. There it was 50 cents a piece for the antigen test, an Abbott test. And it was $5 for a PCR, for a uh, Roche PCR. And the drug is a three month treatment that costs $80,000 in the US and 30,000 in Europe, cost them $35 to $45 to cure it. And in 10 months, they cured Egypt of a very big problem they had which is hepatitis C, and it made serious inroads by developed by giving free treatment for hypertension and for serious diabetes. That's what countries can do. A little bit of help and a lot of effort on the ground themselves. That's what's needed. Now, we talked a lot about what different countries do to help, and I think it was very well said that some countries did this well, Susan said, and some other countries did that well. But we need to walk forward. Every country has to walk forward on two feet, not one. We need very good, efficient public health services doing the diagnosis, the tracing, and the isolation, and we need the medicines. Together, those two can control and eliminate this scourge. Without that, it's going to be whack-a-mole around the globe for as long as we can see. We need all countries to do both well together. And if we do that, we will prevail against this and it won't become an annual or, semi or, or biannual scourge like it well could be, shutting down and countries and, and impacting our lives in so many ways. You know, I would guess that anybody who's listening would like to travel somewhere. For example, take all of South America that's now on the rise. Take India, which is getting over a horrific situation. Take the Olympics that no foreigner can go to in Japan. This disease, a year and a half later, is still going to be a problem another six months from now, and maybe a year from now, and maybe for a long time. We have to use the tools that we're fortunate enough to have in the best possible way. Thank you, Bill. I, I think for all countries to do everything well, it's a, indeed a big task. Um, you mentioned the testing, vaccine, and um, the treatment. So I want to have two questions, both from me and also from audience about vaccine. Number one from the audience question is, how can we continue to get more American vaccinated, especially with the division within the US? And then I think just to look at globally, my question is, um, how do we foster global collaboration to close the vaccine gap among countries? I don't know who wants to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll dive in. I mean, I am sure I would very much like to hear from the other panelists about this, but closing the vaccine gap. 
my, uh, I have two older children who are headed for medical school and they've been volunteering in vaccine centers. So they come home with their stories every day about, um, you know, all the kind of drives that, that are happening to get, you know, more people vaccinated and demystify what this vaccine is all about. Um, I personally have been um, surprised that more uh, more private institutions, whether it's companies or other, um, have not mandated vaccines, but I, I can understand why. Um, I, I do um, appreciate the university systems have started to mandate it so that, you know, they can start bringing kids back on campus. Um, I do think that the, um, you know, making sure that the information about these vaccines were developed with the best uh, technology, with the largest clinical trials, with diverse representation in those trials. I mean, all of that information and being transparent, laying it bare for, you know, the average people, you know, want to see like something that is very uh, factual, open, and not like feeling like they were being uh, duped in some way. I think the combination of that and the combination of um, if you're not vaccinated, your life is going to become increasingly restrictive. It just has to be like wherever you go, you will have to still wear a mask. Or, you know, if you're getting I, seeing that like sports arenas, like for people who aren't vaccinated, you're paying more for the seats and they might not be the best seats and you have to wear a mask. I, I mean, that's reality. So increasingly the benefit of like informing and being honest and transparent and really factual and having people you trust telling you that the vaccines are right and you should take them um, in, you know, whatever uh, kind of cultural ethnicity uh, background that uh, is, you know, is, is representative of you. Um, but then also just the reality of it's going to become more restrictive if you are not vaccinated, I think will help us to kind of get the next, get the next mile. Um, and, uh, and I think the, you know, the other part of this is in the U S we've had, a phenomenal supply chain. We have the might, we have the money, whatever it is. We have, we should have like unlocked our vaccine stores to the rest of the world sooner and got them out there. And, um, and I'm glad to see some of that happening, but I think we could have moved a lot faster to, to help the rest of the world because, you know, it doesn't, doesn't help us. We are very connected um, and, and it's also the right thing to do. Thank you, Susan. And uh, to add on what you mentioned about vaccine, uh, audience have a question about when and whether should a vaccine patent become public uh, to encourage health equality as well. So I don't know who wants to take this. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a strong a strong perspective uh, other than to say um, I think that there's uh, there's sometimes situations in life and in the world that trump intellectual property. I think all of us would probably say that intellectual property is kind of um, foundational, strong protections of intellectual property are, are, um, uh, are you know, foundational to driving innovation in society. Um, but I do think there are moments in history where there are bigger things in protecting you know, a company's right to kind of make profit on things. I think this was one of those moments. Um, I think there will be other moments in the future. I think there have to be ways in which to, you know, fairly compensate organizations for their, uh, you know, intellectual property. But at the same time, um, there have to be, I think, provisions that allow, uh, you know, uh, governments across the world to be able to, to trump those things. And I think that's, you know, we don't have a great global system right now in terms of, you know, kind of leadership of health issues. But if we, if, you know, if, if the UN or the WHO had some kind of authorities around this, um, you know, maybe there's a, a, a way that you can compensate companies for these emergency type situations over a long period of time um, in situations where, you know, exigent circumstances require dominating a patent. Um, but that has to be, you know, something of the scale of what we've just had. Um, otherwise, we will, I think, I think get, get, get in the way of the innovation incentive that I think drives the creation of these solutions in the first place. Thank you, Sachin. Um, yeah, you mentioned it has to be in the scale that we have. So I have a similar question from the audience to talk about, you know, how do we make sure the new approach sticks um, that come out from the pandemic? What this question means is that the pandemic has revealed numerous disparities in healthcare, and sometimes we learn things, but have a short attention span. 
So what can we learn from this today to deliver more effective information and the care itself in the future? How do we make sure this new approach sticks? Uh, well, let me uh, begin to answer that. One thing we've learned is, uh, has been mentioned is the importance of science and technology. Uh, at least in the US, we're getting out of this if we do get out of it, not by virtue of our discipline, but by virtue of our technology and our medicine. So that's, a, that's a very positive. I've just written just today, actually, published a new book. It's called Science is a Superpower. It's in designed to help young people make a decision to take up a life in science and medicine. And I show by example how one human being, one mind can really save the world. That's what science and medicine can do. One mind can change everything. How many fields are there where one person can make all the difference? And it is indeed a superpower. And I've been privileged in my career to know some of these superheroes. I knew Jonas Salk, for example. I knew Melvin Calvin who figured out photosynthesis. Jim Watson who figured out DNA was, was my mentor. The people who learned how to sequence DNA, I knew personally, and I was a student of Wally Gilbert, one of the guys who figured out how to do Illumina and Maxim. And I remember thinking, why are these guys making a machine to sequence DNA? And then I created human genome sciences that use these machines by the, you know, by the room full. So uh, I hope a lasting impression that comes out of this is that a whole new generation is inspired like I was by our leaders saying science is a solution to a lot of our problems. And we're gonna put more money in it, which is now happening. This is kind of a Sputnik moment for science and technology. Uh, you know, what did Sputnik actually do? It taught young people, this is an honorable, great society. You don't have to be some crazy haired guy out there. You can do whatever you want to be a scientist. Just look at who's speaking to you now, right? We don't look like Albert Einstein. But we're all scientists and doing and doing and, and doctors and doing the kind of work that I think that is that plus the, the, the scientific cooperation is something we can learn. Whether we can learn to solve our problems in equity like Sachin would want us to, we do know, and by the way, there's a whole field of social determinants of health, which he's referring to uh, obliquely, uh, is determining 80% of people's health outcomes. Whether we're gonna really be able to tackle those problems with this as the catalyst, it surely revealed it, but we knew it before. Uh, and all the things that we see, we knew before. It just kind of hurts more when you see people die. Like for example, we knew our elder care systems were terrible. I've written two or three books about that topic, about how poor our, even the very best in Sweden, for example. Uh, we put all these people together and we don't pay them, the, the people very much and people are making a lot of money over those things. And they don't take care of older people because if older people are like, in some ways, children, they can't take care for themselves. And you're, you, you see terrible abuses in these, these systems. And we knew that. And now we see it killed them. Okay. And are we going to change our elder care system? Are we going to go to a home care system instead of a uh, elder care system that we've got. I don't know. These are things we could learn from. We may learn. We adapt slowly in those ways. Science is great because it can move faster. Social change requires consensus. You could ask yourself a question I asked myself. If we'd had a different leader, would we had a different response? Well, you look at Europe. They've got a lot of different leaders, right? And they had pretty much the same response we had. A little bit different here and there around the edges. So it isn't only a leadership problem. It's a deeper social problem. It's a deeper anthropological problem. And I think that's another field that we have to begin to study. What is it about countries? What can we do to move ourselves toward a more collective mentality? At least one in which you do believe you're your brother's keeper. And you really incorporate that into your life. And I think that is a lesson. It's a really hard lesson to learn. And, it's, and you know, if you look at the, the sweep of American history and where we are and the troubles we're in right now, it's not really clear how we're gonna come, come out of it. You know, Martin Luther King said, the arc of history tends toward the righteous. Well, maybe it's true and maybe it isn't. But right now we should be engaged in that discussion.
where is that arc of history taking it? And what does this disaster, a necessary disaster that bef has befallen us, tell us that we need to change? And I don't think there's consensus, certainly in our country or other countries around the world. And unfortunately, maybe we'll move on, but there'll be some bright spots like scientific cooperation and more people going to medical school, more people becoming scientists. Thank you, Bill. Um, looking into the future, as you mentioned, a question from the audience and also actually from me is, what are the valuable lessons that we, we learned, the most valuable lessons? You know, we talked a lot about a lot of different things, but from those lessons, what are some practical strategies that countries can take um, to tackle uh, contain future pandemic, factoring in social political issues, healthcare inequality, and access to vaccine and um, therapeutics in developed and developing countries. I mean, for, for me, I would say the, the most important lesson that we learned, um, and I think it's broader than um, you know just pandemic response, is that you know change in healthcare which is typically, you know, kind of an oxymoron because it, 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 it largely goes very slowly in a lot of, and for many good reasons and some bad reasons, um, doesn't necessarily have to be slow, plotting, deliberate, and consensus-based. Um, you can actually change things on, on a dime if you actually want to. And um, policies moved, uh, organizations moved, organizational context moved, that happened very quickly. And I think that that's a, um, an opportunity that, you know, we need to take that. That's a style and strategy that will, I think, accelerate our change efforts if we allow it to going forward. Susie, do you have anything to add? Sorry, well, Susan. Hey, yeah, no problem. Um, I, I think, you know, some of these uh, topics have been uh, touched on already, but I think this, this level of, you know, we are, I think is a reminder that we are all globally connected. There's no way that we lock down and we're safe and we take care of our own and like, you know, our country is good and everything is fine. We're absolutely connected. And so I hope that inspires us to, uh, you know, as uh, it was mentioned, I, you know, your, bro your brother's keeper. I think us having a responsibility, a shared responsibility for humanity. Um, I think the scientific community does a wonderful job of this. I think they should be the role models and example of how we can share information like a new virus or new strain of a virus um, without repercussion. That this is, you know, this is just nature taking its course. We all need to kind of, you know, be communicating, preparing for it. And we treat it as a issue of nature and science and not an issue of like one country versus another country, um, I think is, uh, is important. So this idea of um, global surveillance, uh, this idea of data sharing, this idea of doing all of that without repercussion, doing it in the mind of like science and humanity and, you know, be, doing, the, doing the right thing. Um, and, uh, and then I think the um, access to the latest uh, technology and innovations that are going to, uh, that are going to not only treat this, but um, you know, help us deal with diseases of the future, um, I think is, um, you know, it's, it's in our best interest that we are doing the best for mankind. That always comes back to improving our own life. <laughs> so you can't, you can't sit here and say, my life is good in the U.S. We are, you know, we're uh, kind of increasing our vaccination rate. We have access for anyone who wants to get it, but like India is like surging. Well, the fact that India is surging and the variants are, you know, um, going to be like transmitting and finding their way to other geographies makes it terrible for all of us. Even if you don't believe in just it's the right thing to do, the fact that, you know, we know that it's a connected world uh, should lead us there. So I hope that kind of discipline that scientists have always had, which is like that we want to improve mankind, we want to improve uh, human health together. Um, is uh, is something that you know the larger public <laughs> does embrace and and aspire to. Thank you, Susan. And I think we have uh, time for one questions. And I'll just ask this. I know at this point um, no one can predict, but um, when do you think the global pandemic will end? Will it ever end? And what does it take for us to get there? Is it therapeutic? 
vaccine, testing, all of the above. Well, you might, to all of, of you. I think, first of all, I want to thank you for organizing this. And one of the answers is organizations like uh, yours, uh, organizations which take a global perspective and try to look at all the most serious problems. I think that is part of the answer uh, to this. Uh, the Asia Society is dedicated to trying to bring understanding and knowledge across uh, many di different peoples, particularly the US, but other countries, uh, and internal and, and, and foment uh, uh, dialogues. I think that we already touched on what the answer to the pandemic is, which is walking forward on two legs. One is public health and the other is science and technology and making sure, as we've all emphasized, that it's equitably distributed. That's a big, big challenge. Uh, but it's one that I think that we will meet at least for this pandemic. And then the question is, are we really going to be prepared for the next one, which is surely coming? You know, I'll just talk about a little bit about why we're in the fix that we're in. And that is, there are almost 8 billion of us. We live like bats, actually, in a cave, close together. If you look at a Super Bowl, it looks like a bat cave upside down. You know, 80% of us live in cities. We fly around a lot. We communicate uh, and we live a long time. And the viruses that adapt to those situations are learn all their tricks for hundreds of thousands of years of how to affect this new ecosystem. It isn't that we're going into new ecosystems. We are a new ecosystem. And if you were a virus, you'd say, boy, does this look good to me? Okay. And so that's going to happen. Not just, you know, we've been... Uh, you know, if you count like I do, there may be 10 things that could have been this pandemic in the last 10 years only. And it's going to happen again and again and more frequently because of the way we live. So we've got to be prepared. And I think we've touched on many of the things we can do. The question is, will we do it? And what you see at both national and international levels is not a come to, let's say, in a Christian sense that come to Jesus uh, time, we see a lot of the same old things happening. You know, scapegoating this one, fighting with that one, uh, adjusting your politics to fit the mood of the country. You know, all sorts of things that, that uh, it's just human behavior. And hopefully at some point we will evolve to some more harmonious, uh, situation, but it takes many, many bumps along the way. And I think it's uncertain as to how long we're going to get there and when even this pandemic will be over, much less prepared to deal as a global uh, unity with the next one. Thank you so much, Bill. And I know whether Susan or Sachin, you want to add anything to that? I just want a signed copy of Dr. Hesler. Well, likewise. <laughs> I, 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 I We're all on, you know that thing. I want a it starts with an A. All of his books, all of his books. <laughs> all of your books. Oh, thank you, that's very good. Not, not, signed, not signed copies, not signed copies. Yeah. <laughs> I, want, I want a copy of signed nice, superpower. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you so guys much. For your good work. Yeah. Thanks, our, our moderator. And thank you, Bill. Thank and the agents is ahead, too. Thank you, Sachin. Thank everyone for dialing in too. And uh, you have shared so much of your knowledge, your experience. Uh, I know we have talked a lot about com complex questions. There are many questions that we answered and there are many questions we didn't answer due to time. And also it's just a complex future that we're facing. So thanks everyone for dialing in. Please stay safe, stay healthy, stay vigilant and take care of each other. And back to you, Charlie. Thank you, Iwan and Susan Session and Bill for an amazing discussion on these really critical issues of our times. And I'm, and I'm sure we'll be revisiting um, these yet again. And hopefully we'll have this wonderful um, guest back again to talk about this, this topic as, as time goes on. Um, I'd also like to thank our promotional partners for this evening, Alliance for Southern California Innovation and Chan Shanghai, uh, Asia Society, our Hong Kong Center, Biocom, the BioCalendar, Biotech Connections, Los Angeles, C-Suite, Give to Asia, the Harvard Club of Southern California will be here, um, the Stanford Asia Pacific uh, American Alumni Club, um, the Health Business Association, USC Marshall School of Business Health Leadership Association, as well as the 
USC Marshall School of Business Art Eye Care MBA program. We also like to thank our partner for this evening, Bioscience Less LA, um, for help uh, organizing this program. Um, and we also like to, you know, make uh, a pitch for people to support us in putting on programs like this. We make them uh, available for free because these are important topics, and we want everybody to be able to participate. So if you're able to uh, join, and hopefully you can become a member or to help donate to support us to continue these programs, we'd be deeply grateful. Um, we'd also like to let you know about our upcoming program, um, which is uh, will be on uh, Monday, May 28th, where we'll be talking about affordable housing and, and the lessons that, uh, that are, uh, uh, can be learned from what Singapore and what Los Angeles are doing in this another critical area for our time and our society. So um, thank you again for joining and thank you for the wonderful speakers and thank you again for a fantastic program. And um, we hope to see you again next time. Thank you and good night.